In this lecture, you'll learn about disk ownership and how it's assigned to the disks in your cluster. The first point in this lecture is super important. Disks and the aggregates that are made up of those disks are owned by one and only ever one node. The nodes HA pair can take ownership of the disks if the first node fails. So let's say we've got an HA pair with controller one and controller two. Controller one owns its disks and controller two owns its disks. If controller one fails, then controller two will detect that and take over ownership of controller one's disks until controller one comes back up again. The SAS connections from the HA pair are active standby. So you do not get load balancing on those SAS connections going down to the disk shelves. You saw in the last lecture that both controller one and controller two are connected to the same stacks of disks with those SAS connections. But it's only ever controller one or controller two that is going to be sending traffic over those SAS connections. If the disks are owned by controller one, then it's controller one's SAS connections which are active and controller two's connections are standby. If controller two takes over ownership of those disks, then controller two's SAS connections will then transition to active. And obviously on the other side, for the disks that are owned by controller two, it's always controller two's SAS connections that are active. Controller one's connections are standby. They only come into effect if controller two fails and controller one takes over ownership of its disks. So again, those SAS connections, you don't get active active load balancing through both. It's active standby for redundancy. Nodes can, however, reach other nodes aggregates over the cluster interconnect switches. So the incoming client connections don't always have to hit the node that owns the disks. For example, let's say that we've got an aggregate made up of disks that are owned by controller one. The incoming client connections do not have to terminate on controller one to get access to that data. The incoming client connections can hit any node on the cluster and we can still reach that data over the cluster interconnect onto node one and then through its SAS connections down to the disks. So this is going to be easier to understand and visualize with a diagram. So let's do that now. So in our example, I have got a two node cluster. I've got controller one and I've got controller two and controller one is on the left and its disks are on the left. Controller two is on the right and the disks that it owns are on the right. For the example, we're going to be talking about aggregate one, which we'll say is owned by controller one. Let's say it's on this disk shelf here on the bottom. Both of my controllers are connected to the cluster network and they're also connected to a data network, which is used for the incoming client connections. And clients can send traffic in to read or write data, either terminating on a part or in controller one, or it can be terminating on a port on controller two. So first example, let's say that a client wants to read or write data on aggregate one, which is owned by controller one, and that incoming connection terminates on controller one. So let's say that it is NFS, for example, and the incoming connection hits an IP address, which is homed on controller one. So the traffic comes in over the data network, it hits controller one, and then controller one will read or write to the disks over its SAS connections. Next example, let's say that the client is again accessing aggregate one, but this time rather than hitting an IP address on a port on controller one, they hit a different IP address, which is on a port on controller two. And you'll learn this when we get to the networking section, this is very common. 
you don't want all of your incoming connections coming in just to one controller. You're going to get better performance on your cluster if you spread, if you load balance those incoming client connections. So you are going to want them to come in on all the different nodes in your cluster. So sometimes they'll hit controller one, for that example. Sometimes incoming client connections will hit controller two. In this slide here, the incoming connection has hit controller two and they want to access data on aggregate one. Controller two does not use its SAS connections going down to those shelves. This is active standby, so it's active on controller one because it owns the disks. It's standby on controller two. It's not used unless it takes ownership of those disks because controller one fails. Right now, controller one is up. This is the normal operations. So controller two does still have access to those disks, but the traffic will go over the cluster interconnect. This has a minimal impact on latency. I'll talk about that more in the networking section as well, because I know that some of you will have been worrying about that. The, the amount of latency added going over the cluster interconnect is very small. So you actually get best performance of your cluster by spreading the incoming connections over the different nodes in your cluster. Okay, so let's say that controller one does actually fail. So controller one goes down, controller two will detect that, and then it will take ownership of controller one's disks when high availability kicks in. So at this point, the SAS connections from controller two go active down to those disks where aggregate one is. Now we have an incoming client connection. See, it can't come in in controller one because controller one is down. We have an incoming client connection on controller two and controller two will access the data over its SAS connections going down to the disks. Now, in a lot of environments, we're going to have more than two nodes in the cluster. So you can see in the diagram now, I've got a four node cluster. Controller one and controller two are an HA pair and controller three and controller four are an HA pair. Each of the controllers originally had its own disks, which it owned. In our, in our example here, controller one has gone down. Controller two is its HA pair. So controller two will take ownership of its disks. So right now, controller two owns aggregate one, which was normally owned by controller one, and it also owns aggregate two, which is normally owned by itself. So it is active for the SAS connections going down to aggregate one and aggregate two as well. Controller three is active for its aggregate and controller four is active on the SAS connections going down to its aggregate. We've got four nodes, or sorry, three nodes, three controllers still up in our cluster. Whenever a client wants to access aggregate two, three, or four, it can access that data through any of the different nodes. If, for example, a client wants to access aggregate three and the incoming client connection hits controller two, then the data will be accessed over the cluster interconnect to controller three and then through the SAS cables down to its disks. Okay, next thing to talk about, this is something that was covered earlier on as well when we went through the boot up process lecture, but just to give you a refresher on it again here, we have an aggregate zero and a volume zero on every node in the cluster. When the system is powered on, it loads the ONTAP system image, the operating system from Compact Flash. It then loads the system information from disk. So any configuration that you do on the system is going to be saved to disk. That information gets saved into volume zero, which is located in aggregate zero. The lowest level that data is accessible at is at the volume level. So we need an aggregate and a volume to hold that system information. That is in vol zero and aggregate zero. Vol zero and aggregate zero are not used for any normal user data. They are used purely for system information. The system information is replicated throughout all the nodes in the cluster. So let's say that you open up an SSH session for management and you connect to the cluster management address. And let's say that that cluster management address is currently homed on a port on node one. 
Well, when you write the information, it will be written to node one first and it will go into its vol zero. That information will then be replicated over the cluster interconnect to all of the other nodes in the cluster and they will all end up with the same information in their vol zeros. So every node in the cluster has an aggregate zero and a vol zero and the information is replicated between all of them. If the system is factory reset, so you saw this with the boot menu before, we could choose that option number four to do a factory reset of the system. If you do that, all of the disks are wiped and then a new aggregate zero and vol zero is created on each node in the cluster. Okay, next thing, so back on our disk ownership. Ownership of disks must be assigned to a specific node in the HA pair before disks can be used. And disk auto assign is enabled by default. So normally whenever you put a new disk into the system, everything is hot swappable. You put a new disk in there, it will be automatically assigned to one of the nodes. And that auto assignment can be done at the stack, the shelf, or the bay level. What that means, at the stack level, all the disks in a stack will be assigned to the controller connected to the I.O. module A on the stack. You remember from the hardware section earlier, you saw on the back of our disk shelves, they had I.O. module A and I.O. module B. One of the controllers is connected to I.O. module A, the other one is connected to I.O. module B. So if disk ownership is configured to work at the stack level, then the controller which is connected to IO module A on the stack is going to own all of the disks in that stack. That is the default for the non-entry level platforms and that ties up with the examples that I've been showing you earlier. Another option that you can configure is to assign disk ownership at the shelf level. If you do that, then half the shelves in a stack will be assigned to each node. So it's pretty self-explanatory really. With the first one there, all the disks in a particular stack are owned by one node. If you choose shelf level, then in the same stack, half will be owned by one node, the other half will be owned by the other. And the last option that we have is at the bay level. At the bay level, half the disks in a shelf will be assigned to each node. And that is the default for entry level platforms. The reason for that is that with a lot of entry-level platforms, they will have the internal drives there and it's just used for a small deployment and they don't have any external disks. So obviously, if we used the stack or the shelf level there, then all the disks would end up being owned by one node. It wouldn't be good for performance for load balancing. We don't want to do that. So in those small entry-level platforms that have just got that one set of internal drives, we want half the drives to be owned by one node and half to be owned by the other node. So that's why the default is bay level on the entry level systems. Okay, the last thing to tell you is that that automatic disk assignment, it's enabled by default, but you can disable it if you want to. If you do do that, then you'll have to manually assign any new disks you add to the system before they can be used. So by default, auto assign is turned on. You just hot swap a drive in. It's going to be automatically assigned ownership by one of the nodes and you can use it immediately. If you do turn off auto assign, then you have to remember whenever any new disks are added to the system, you're going to have to manually specify the node which owns them. A reason you would do that is if you wanted to have more granular control over which node owns your disks. Thanks for watching. If you want to get hands-on practice with NetApp Storage for free on your laptop, then you can download my free ebook, which you can see above my head right now. Also check out my NetApp Storage Complete course, which will teach you everything you could possibly want to know about ONTAP. Thanks.